yeah so i'm going to click the go live okay okay yeah. so uh, sasanka you just check once if it is oh yeah it is live now like okay so we can start yeah just Yeah, don't uh, say. Yeah, we can start. Uh, so should I start? Yeah, yeah. Asman, you can start. Yeah. yeah. Hi everybody. Uh, sorry for the delay. So we had a small delay due to some technical issues. So we are live now. So uh, welcome everybody to the I uh, technical lecture series number uh, twenty three. Today uh, we have with us Ranjay Krishna. And he will be uh, delivering a talk titled uh, "Visual Intelligence from Human Interaction." So, uh, before moving forward with the agenda, I would like to take a few minutes and uh, introduce uh, Ranjay Krishna. So, Ranjay Krishna is an assistant professor at the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. His uh, research lies at the intersection of computer vision and human-computer interaction. His research has received best. Outstanding paper and orals at CVPR. Finder hasn't added support for at CVPR, uh, ACL, CSCW, New uh, NeurIPS, UIST, and ECCV, and it has also been reported by Science Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and the PBS Nova. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering and in computer science from Cornell University. A master's uh, degree in computer science from Stanford University, and a PhD in computer science from Stanford University. So, uh, with this, uh, I would like to hand it over uh, to Ranjay Krishna. Sir. sir, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for thank you for having me. I just want to do a quick sound check. Everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for the introduction. So yeah, sorry again for the delay. We're gonna go quickly to make up for time. So I'm here to talk to you about how we can design machines that can acquire uh, what I like to call visual intelligence and to do it through human interactions. But to sort of explain why this is important, let's sort of take a step back and think about where computer vision is today. So computer vision is a, the branch of uh, artificial intelligence where we train machines to learn how to see the world. And although computer vision has gotten really good at identifying objects today, uh, our world is often more than just a collection of objects. So our machines can identify birds and cats and dogs, but there's a lot more usually that's going on all around us. Uh, our world is rich and vibrant, and there's tons of different ways in which uh, are the encounters that we have are surprising. Uh, we often find it's a Oh, uh, excuse me, Sanjay sir. Uh, yeah, your voice is not audible. Yeah, not able to. It, it was there actually. Just one minute before. Oh, excuse me, Sanjay sir. Oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah, it's better. No, it is. Yeah, 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 it's better. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Someone had a question, I think. No, it's fine. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, so despite an amazing set of advancements over the last 10 years, a lot of the deep learning models that we have that are powering a lot of the computer vision technology, they truly struggle to really understand this visual world. And we've seen over and over again from a lot of prior research over the last couple of years, that whenever our computer vision systems encounter new concepts that are missing from its training data, their outputs are completely unpredictable. For example, rhinoceroses, this is a picture uh, from Kaziroga. Um, uh, and so whenever these rhinoceroses are missing 
in the uh, in the training set, which unfortunately they are. When these models encounter them, they have no way of actually um, recognizing them, and their behaviors are completely unpredictable. Now, this kind of problem occurs over and over again, regardless of how much we sort of train our models. Uh, for example, even the computers that uh, we have today in the world, they look very different from the computers that were collected in the training sets that were used to train a lot of our AI systems. Um, and it's not just the computers, but the phones as well. They've sort of changed quite a bit over the last four or five years as well. And aside from that, we have new products today. We have new kinds of species that have been uncovered. And so whenever these kinds of species or objects or anything uh, changes, our models become obsolete. They stop being able to operate in our real, our real world because our real world is constantly evolving and changing. Now, even though um, um, machines aren't able to do this, we know that people are very good at identifying new concepts and learning them really quickly. And people are able to do this because of what they call um, social development theory. So this theory sort of talks about how human development is a socially mediated process in which we learn new concepts, we learn new beliefs and new cultural norms, and we learn these sort of new things from inquisitive dialogues with more knowledgeable members of society. So for example, people learn um, new concepts by asking questions to other people who might know the answer to those questions. And we quickly learn what kinds of questions people are able to help us with, and we do that by inferring the sort of implicit social cues from all of our past interactions that we've had so far. So enabling this kind of human-like visual intelligence, it's a challenging problem. And it really requires us to fundamentally rethink how we design reinforcement learning agents or computer vision systems that can really learn from people out in real social environments. Ones where people aren't just sort of being trained to provide feedback, but ones where models can figure out what they need to learn and also what kinds of questions or interactions will help them learn new things over time. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have already heard of ChatGPT. It's all over the news. A lot of people are using it. But even ChatGPT was sort of trained with 40 different workers that were brought in and told, trained how to provide feedback to the original GPT model so that they could improve it over time. Um, and what I'm arguing for is that all of these methods, they're very outdated, and they, they sort of immediately become obsolete. So even ChatGPT is obsolete the moment it's created. And so what we need instead is this ability to sort of go beyond and push towards learning from human interactions. This sort of methodology through which you can sort of push the boundaries of what you know continuously over time throughout the entire deployment of any sort of machine learning model out there. And that's really my entire research agenda. Uh, I, I build computer vision systems that learn from interactions with real people. Uh, and in today's talk, we're going to explore how we can design some of these sort of agents that can learn from new interactions with people. And specifically, we're going to draw ideas from, again, social development theory, specifically from Lev Vygotsky and Grice's maxims from social psychology to develop a line of work that shows you that it is possible to build computer vision systems that intersect with the way that people interact with machines and through those interactions learn from that process. So uh, the main sort of takeaway from this entire talk is that instead of passively hoping that the kind of data you need to uh, learn is handed to you in the form of books, you're going to learn them by asking people questions. So first, we're going to talk about this framework, which I call socially situated artificial intelligence. And, it, and then through this framework, we're going to learn how to build design objectives that will enable these agents to generate interactions that can then learn from people out in the real world. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to take those interactions, deploy them out into the real world um, in existing social environments, and then show that we can do better the traditional methods of learning uh, different kinds of machine learning models. OK, so let's get started. Um, so the reason that we don't really have machine learning models that can operate under every circumstance is because, again, whenever they see new kinds of concepts that are missing from their training data, they completely fail. And the sort of metaphor to keep in mind here is that today's predominant methods, they're really akin to locking these agents alone in a room full of stack of books. And these books can be anything. And today, they're often large volumes of manually labeled 
training data like ImageNet, or they're scraped uh, internet data in the form of any sort of text online or text and images online. And while these resulting models that you learn from this sort of traditional way of training models has done pretty well, they still, again, struggle whenever they see these kinds of novel situations, whenever they are uh, deployed out into the real world. So when a concept is missing from its training data, these agents have no means of acquiring it because the walls that sort of limit their training, they prevent them from going outside and learning anything new. And what we're really trying to focus on is moving these agents outside into existing social environments so they can learn through social interactions. And what this sort of looks like is, um, again, drawing ideas from human uh, development. It, it takes the form of asking questions. So when people encounter uncertainty, they ask questions to other people around them. And from that dialogue, they learn new kinds of information. Now, the problem with asking questions is that it's a pretty difficult thing to do. It's really hard to know what is the right question to ask. And it's hard to do that because not every question is informative. So there are some questions that uh, might not yield new information. It might not teach you something new. And there are some kinds of questions that might violate some sort of unspoken social norm. For example, if you ask a question that is really hard for somebody to understand, then you're likely not going to get a response. And if you don't get a response, then you don't end up learning anything new. So this challenge of figuring out what questions to ask, it's, it sort of requires two separate goals that need to be achieved. So uh, these machines need to continuously learn how to interact with people in order to figure out uh, what interactions to engage in in the first place. So at any point, this agent needs to make this trade-off between these two twin goals of interacting to learn and learning to interact. So you need to figure out what you need to learn, and you also need to figure out how what kinds of things people are willing to teach you. And if you don't end up optimizing for both of these rewards, what you end up getting is an agent that ends up generating questions that people will just refuse to respond to. So for example, it, it, you know, if, if a question uh, says, is that food, that might sound rude. And if it's rude, people might not respond to you because it violates some sort of unspoken social norm. Some questions might be too tacit, uh, meaning that people just expect you to know some answers. And again, in those situations, they might not help you learn anything new. Uh, and in other cases, it might require, uh, require some high cognitive effort to actually understand what is being asked. And in some cases, the question itself might violate Grice's maxims. So again, in those situations, people will just not respond. And if you build agents that ask these kinds of questions, they'll sort of be stuck in their, uh, in their training because they're unable to get people to teach it anything new. And to solve this problem, uh, what we do is introduce this um, framework called socially situated artificial intelligence. And what we're going to sort of talk about today is how to sort of formulate this entire objective or framework so that it can ask these kinds of questions, questions that end up actually teaching it something new, questions that people actually respond to uh, with answers about things that it doesn't already know. So we'll show that it can learn about food, it can learn about birds, it can learn about all kinds of things. And in fact, it's not just learning, but people are happy to sort of provide this kind of feedback and they're willing to engage in these kinds of conversations with our machines. Okay, so let's go get started with the, the framework and then we'll talk about the rest. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, sir, your uh, test camera video is freezing, freeze next to me. Oh. I have no idea why. You can on and off. I think that's fine. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, otherwise you ignore, that's it. okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, otherwise you ignore. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure why. So you can't see me at all. Uh, no. 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 That, that's fine, actually. So just ignore that. Let's get you on our call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very strange okay. that this is yeah, happening. Yeah, now it is fine. Now it is coming. Okay. That's good. All yeah. right. Okay. Okay. So as I already mentioned, the current way to sort of build our training systems is that we collect a set of data points, and then we use those data points to learn a model. Now, we're going to start off with this original sort of traditional way of collecting uh, data and training models. But then once we have an original initial model, we're going to deploy that model out into a social environment. 
And then, of course, this initial data set can be empty, meaning that the model initially might not know anything. But regardless, it's going to end up learning things through interactions. Um, so eventually, it'll encounter something that it's never seen before. And when that happens, that gets sent to a socially situated agent that learns to produce a question about, about that image. So it learns to ask a question so that it can hopefully learn something new. And when people respond to it, we parse that response. We extract the answer if an answer exists. And if the answer does exist, then we add it to our data set as a new uh, data point. And then we continue sort of retraining the model so that it over time improves uh, and learns new concepts. But not only that, but we also uh, take a look at all of our past interactions and figure out what are the kinds of questions that people are willing to answer for us. So what are the kinds of things that people want to respond to? What are the ones that they are not interested in responding to? Then we again use that information to guide the socially situated agent to avoid asking questions that nobody will respond to and push it towards asking questions where people actually help it learn something new. Now we can formalize this sort of agent itself as a language-based reinforcement learning agent that takes as input an image and produces some sort of a language-based question uh, as its output space. Now, uh, a lot of work in the past that I've done sort of builds data sets that allows the ability to train these kinds of models. And so we can train something like this from very simple methods uh, that take images as input and produce outputs in the form of questions. And we build data sets that enable these kinds of things in the past. So aside from just the initial model, we have to now design rewards so that over time, it learns to ask better and better questions. Uh, and so designing rewards is a really fundamental part of building any sort of reinforcement learning agent, because only if you have good rewards would you end up learning better behaviors over time. And in our case, there are no rewards that are really coming from uh, the environment. The rewards have to be implicitly designed because the agent has to figure out what are the kinds of things that are uh, helping it learn something new. And so in our framework, we designed two kinds of rewards. The first one is this knowledge reward. And this knowledge reward encourages interactions that discover new concepts. And then the second reward is this interaction reward that figures out what are the kinds of questions uh, that people actually are interested in responding to. So for the knowledge reward, there's been a long line of work in active learning and trying to figure out what are the different ways in which we can identify what the current model doesn't know. In our case, we designed the knowledge reward as a simple sort of uncertainty of uh, some sort of a recognition model. So we have a recognition model that's initially trained from our data set. And whenever it's sort of uncertain about something that it sees, that's a good kind of question to ask. So when we generate questions that the current model doesn't know how to answer, those are good behaviors to encourage. So high uncertainty leads to high reward. The second thing we do is we draw on ideas from non-reactive measures in sociology, and sort of which sort of say that people's interaction preferences, um, you can sort of probe for them and figure them out without directly asking them. And we can do this by designing a social interaction reward in the form of a binary classifier that learns to identify uh, questions that people will respond to and give you answers for. And then uh, the negative examples are the questions that people either don't respond to or are more confused and might respond but will not provide you an answer. OK, so I'll show you this more empirically later on. But it's important to know that we have both of these rewards. And both of these rewards are very, very important. If you end up using just the knowledge reward, what you end up getting is an agent that learns to ask really high uncertainty types of questions. But these are the kinds of questions that people just don't want to respond to. And they don't want to respond to it because, again, it's really hard to actually make sense of what this question is trying to ask you. And because it takes so much high cognitive effort, people won't respond. And then similarly, if you only try to optimize for the interaction reward, meaning that you only try to identify questions that give you uh, responses, then again, that's not really useful because you're going to end up asking questions that you already know the answers to. And so it doesn't teach you anything new. So you need both of these two rewards, and you need to balance between the two of them to be able to identify good questions that actually teach you something new. OK, so now that we have our rewards sort of laid out, uh, let's talk about how to sort of generate informative and useful questions. OK, so again, going back to our diagram of how to uh, intuitively think about this entire process, you have some sort of an agent that is learning to take in input images and produce language outputs. Now, you can um, design this in a lot of different ways. For our case, we design it as a simple encoder or decoder system, where the encoder takes in the image, and it sort of embeds this image in some sort of a latent space, where your latent space is just some sort of high-dimensional uh, space. 
And from that space, we sample, and we can now use a decoder to decode questions related to that image. And the reason you might want to use some sort of a variational sort of latent space is because there are many different questions you can ask for a single image, and a variational latent space allows you to sort of sample from that space and produce many different kinds of questions that are all related to this given image. Now, the problem with this latent space, the latent space of all possible questions that you might want to ask, is that it's combinatorially vast. And the way to think about combinatorially vast is that you can stitch together any two set of words or a set of words uh, to sort of um, produce any sentence at all. So the space of all possible sentences that you can utter by just combining the words that you know, it's really, really big. And finding questions within that space or even grammatically correct things to say those are very small. There's only a small subset of things that are actually grammatically correct. And within that space, there's only a small subset of points that are actually informative, meaning that there's only a few things that you can ask that actually lead to something new, new kinds of knowledge to be discovered. And this problem that we're trying to tackle is even harder because within that space of all questions that you might want to ask about, um, uh, about the world, there's only a small subset that your current model doesn't know, so you need to quickly identify what that small subset is. And then within that subset, you need to find the socially interesting ones that people will actually respond to and teach you. And then finally, the reason this entire problem is extremely hard is because over time, your model trains and learns something new, so you have this non-stationary behavior where as your model improves and learns some concepts, there are new kinds of concepts that it now needs to learn. And so this process, uh, of relearning what is informative and what is socially interesting, that process continues throughout the entire deployment of any sort of system, socially situated system that you might want to build. And so searching in this large combinatorial space is extremely expensive. And not only is it expensive, you have to continuously keep doing this over and over again as your model learns. And you know, over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so, there's been a lot of work in trying to build good reinforcement learning agents that can learn from interactions with people. But they've only seen success in one of two conditions. In the first condition, we've only seen success when human feedback is explicitly provided. So in developmental robotics, Andrea Tomas, Cynthia Brazil, there's been a lot, they've done a lot of work in building social agents that can take in human feedback. Even ChatGPT takes in explicit human feedback. And those do really well because people are being trained to provide the kind of feedback that help these models learn the most. But in the real world, out in real social situations, you don't have anybody being trained to provide good feedback. These models, they then need to figure out themselves how to identify good feedback. The second condition where reinforcement learning has really worked is in really small action spaces. So things like games and simulations where the number of possible actions that you can take are really small. So successes like chess and AlphaGo, those are the kinds of games where these models do really well because a possible set of moves that you can make are much smaller than all the words that you can utter to form the next sentence. So with noisy sort of rewards that we're building out uh, to identify what is, uh, what is informative and what is socially acceptable, um, this agent quickly ends up producing questions that veer away from the space of useful questions and eventually end up in spaces where it produces complete gibberish. And it does this because it's so hard to find the space of possible things that actually help it learn something new. And so whenever it ends up producing meaningless behavior or meaningless questions, people have no idea how to respond to it at all and they stop responding completely. And whenever they stop responding, the entire learning process halts. So to solve this problem, we draw on this idea from a multiple intersecting social science fields. And they all say that while this action space of all possible things you can say is really, really combinatorially vast, the useful interactions or useful kinds of questions that we might want to ask, they often lie within a small subset of this larger space. Uh, another way to think about this is that people interact with each other using a sort of low dimensional manifold of this entire action space. And we know this is true because language is if distributed. You only need to know a few thousand words to be able to communicate with somebody. You don't use all most of the words in the English language. Uh, you only use a few. And similarly, the norms and social scripts that we've developed, they also are very, very limited for the most part. You know, we move our hands in a very sort of limited way when we speak to one another because we've developed this sort of 
small set of possible movements that convey what we want to convey. And even though we could sort of move and act in ways that are very, very different, we usually don't just because we don't need to. Um, and so using this insight in mind, what we do is we train and identify this interaction manifold, this low dimensional space where these useful questions are likely to lie. And once you identify that low dimensional manifold, you can now sort of use that as a surrogate smaller action space for reinforcement learning. And so without this interaction manifold, what you end up getting are agents that quickly veer off and produce meaningless behavior. But when you constrain your entire search process, to this low dimensional manifold, what you end up getting is behavior that quickly sort of learns how to identify good questions. And as it learns, it modifies and stays within that space. So it only produces meaningful questions. So this manifold really helps quite a bit because it, it, it reduces or removes the need for having any sort of language modeling to identify good or bad questions because we don't need it anymore. We just need, um, these two rewards, this knowledge reward and interaction reward to identify the good sort of spaces within this manifold that help us learn something new. Okay, so putting all these things together, what you end up getting is this encoder that takes an image, embeds it somewhere into the space, this low dimensional manifold. And from there, now we can sort of uh, sample using a decoder and produce questions. And those questions go out to social media. And when the answers come back, uh, they come back a a as rewards that we can then use to identify what are good points within this manifold so that we ask better questions. So what's nice is that it's not just social media and the people that we interact with that are part of the environment, but the entire decoder now you can think of as part of the environment because none of that is really changing. The only thing that's really changing is where you sort of embed these, these images so that you can ask the best kind of questions. So by limiting our entire action space, not as the space of words, but as the, the sort of points on this manifold, we can sort of quickly uncover good sort of meaningful behavior without necessarily having to um, um, build agents that veer off and produce meaningless questions. Okay, so putting all this sort of together, what you end up with is this system that we built that looks at social media, identifies images that it's, it's sort of uncertain about, those images come in, we produce a question associated with that image. The question goes out to social media in the form of a comment. And if people respond to us, we parse that response. And depending on whether it's a positive or negative, we do different things. So if it's a negative interaction, meaning that people didn't respond to us or they were confused, then that becomes a negative reward for our interaction. And then if they do respond to us with a question, uh, with, a, with a response, with an answer, then that becomes a positive instance for our interaction and we learn something new. So it's a new data point for our knowledge reward. And so with those, we sort of retrain our interaction model and our recognition model. And when we use these two reward systems as, um, as these rewards to then fine tune what kinds of questions we should be asking next. So over time, every interaction teaches us something new. It teaches us what are good interactions to have, what are good knowledge pieces that we've learned now, and then once we sort of learn these things, we update what kinds of questions we should ask next. And this entire process continues over and over again. So with the system in place, let's now talk about um, how we can sort of um, deploy this and what kind of results we ended up getting. So we ended up deploying this on Instagram. So we built AI systems uh, with accounts where people um, were interacting with our system completely out in the wild. Our, our, our system would go out, find images that people are posting publicly, and then uh, identify the, those specific images that contain concepts that it's never seen before. And then it would generate questions and then post the most likely or useful question to, to the Instagram post as a question. And then people would respond to it or choose not to respond to it. It was all up to them. There was no training that was being done. People were completely interacting with it as if they would interact with another person online. And then through those interactions, it ended up learning. Now, I'm not showing this here, but in all of our questions that we asked, we do self-identify. Uh, we our, our system does tell people that it's a research project and it's sort of learning about the visual world um, so that people know who they're interacting with. They don't think or be, are being deceived into thinking that they're interacting with a person, even though they're not. So let me show you some examples of the kinds of interactions that it ends up um, issuing. Uh, so it asks about uh, questions like, what is a dog's tail resting on? Or is the boardroom carpeted? It learns to associate water with life vests and asks if the person is wearing a life vest. 
Uh, it also learns to ask questions about new objects like food, animals, airplanes, uh, and sometimes it makes mistakes. It, it thinks that this crocodile is a bird and people love to correct this agent. And so this is a learned behavior that it quickly figures out because whenever it tries to make a guess and it's wrong, people are more likely to respond and help it than simply asking what animal is that. It also learns about attributes like the materials, things are made out of, the shapes of things, the sizes and colors. Uh, and of course, it's responses that it gets vary quite a bit in length and vocabulary. Some people are very straightforward and they respond with uh, short responses like it's a square. And sometimes they sort of give you this very detailed sort of information about actions and verbs and activities and all these other things that are going on in the image. And over time, uh, I'm going to quickly go through this. But what's sort of fun is that we find that um, if you don't use this interaction manifold, then the, the responses quickly drop and you end up getting a model that doesn't end up learning quite a lot. Um, and it doesn't end up learning a lot because people just stop responding to it. And the response rate just drops quite drastically. But if you do end up using this interaction manifold as a way to constrain your search base, then you end up with questions that improve over time. And um, over the course of our deployment, over interacting with uh, 200,000 people, uh, our agent does end up increasing its responses, where now about a third of its questions get answered. And then from those responses, our agent is also able to learn um, new kinds of visual concepts. Um, so when we evaluate what it's sort of learned on a held out test set that we also collected from social media, we find that our model does better than traditional methods for training these things. And this, this is good because it means that when you learn in the domain, in the real world, then you end up learning concepts that are otherwise missing in a lot of traditional machine learning or computer vision data sets. And because you're learning something that is very particular about the domain in which you're operating in, you perform better within that domain. And aside from that, there's also a lot of things that it ends up learning that are very difficult to learn normally. So fine-grained categories of birds like magpie or specific types of flowers like dahlias or types of cheese like feta, these aren't things that a normal person would necessarily be able to answer for you if you paid them to answer these questions. But the person who's taking these photos and uploading them, they've most likely encountered these birds or flowers or cheese in their day-to-day -day life. And that's why they're uploading these photos. And because they've encountered them, they're more likely to know more specific information about these images. So you can't necessarily collect this kind of data from uh, paying somebody to answer these questions. But if you go to the person who's posting about these kinds of things, you're more likely to learn something from them. And then we did a bunch of other ablations as well to try to figure out where and how these things work. Uh, and here I'm showing you what happens if you only use the knowledge reward and don't use the interaction reward. So if you're only trying to optimize for knowledge, then you're again going to end up producing questions that nobody wants to respond to. And so you don't learn as much. But if you really consider both of these two objectives, then you end up increasing your response rates over time. And because people are responding to you more frequently, you end up learning faster and you end up learning more things. And then um, the final sort of result here that's maybe kind of interesting is that aside from just asking questions, we find that our agent also learns quite a few social norms that have been established in the environment. So for example, uh, it learns to group together different kinds of questions um, and ask questions that are consistent with a lot of prior social science literature, specifically HCI literature coming out from Meredith Morris and other people like J.B. Teven, where they've studied how people ask questions to one another on websites like Quora. And we find that our agent also learns to ask similar kinds of questions to people on Instagram. So uh, for example, our agent learns to ask more questions that can be easily answered because it knows that if questions are easy, people are more likely to answer them. Uh, it also learns to ask questions that are things like existence, like is that a bear, or color questions like what color is the wall behind the fabric. The agent also learns to demonstrate some amount of social proof of its recognition ability by mentioning concepts that it's recognized in the image. So for example, here it knows what a teddy is, so it asks what is in front of the teddy. It also learns to ask, uh, learns to avoid asking vague questions or open-ended questions that don't have a single answer, because whenever there are questions that are more open-ended, people have a harder time answering them. So again, they stop responding to these kinds of questions. So questions like what is a child doing or is a man wearing gloves 
or, or, or why is a man wearing gloves? Those kinds of questions have many different answers and you're unlikely to get responses from them. And then we've talked about this before, but uh, any kinds of question that violates Grice's maxims in the form of um, just being too difficult to understand, and those kinds of questions just don't get any responses at all. We also wanted to see what happens if we um, ask people to improve the questions we, we were trying to ask. And we found something interesting. We found that people perform a lot better than our model does, which is expected. Uh, so while our model was able to get a uh, response rate of somewhere around 33%, people, when they were asked to sort of change the questions to be to increase the likelihood of getting responses, they got a response rate of about 37%. And what they did was kind of interesting. They didn't really modify the question themselves, but they added things to those questions. So for example, they sometimes complimented the photo, say that's a very good looking uh, thing. What is the name of the dish? Uh, and sometimes they would sort of justify why they're asking a question. So for example, they'll say, what type of bread is it? And they'll put a justification, like it's, it looks like a sourdough bread with something in it. Uh, and then, you know, there, there are a bunch of these sort of different kinds of things that people would do to try to sort of get more responses from people. And we refer to these kinds of things as social strategies. Uh, and there's a whole host of social strategies that have been explored in some of the papers we've worked on where we identify the ways in which it affects how people respond to questions. So overall, that's uh, the... Uh, the main sort of part of the project, and it's worth sort of thinking about some of the ethical implications of this kind of research, um, mainly just because, uh, you know, when you're doing this kind of research, you end up with a ton of risks that are associated with it, mainly because you've got machine learning agents that are not just interacting with users, but a whole host of people on existing social platforms. And so there are quite a few things that you need to think about. One of the big, one is, big ones is that, um, our agent ended up interacting with quite a sizable population of people on social media. So each of our ablations interacted with somewhere around 200,000 people online. And so in total, we interacted with over a million people on, on Instagram. And a good question to ask ourselves um, um, is what are okay interactions to have and what are interactions that we should avoid? And we were asking ourselves this question when we started this project. And one of the big sort of decisions we made very, very early on in the project is to make sure that we avoid interacting with any sort of private content. So every single interaction that we ended up having, they only happen with publicly accessible posts uh, that can be interacted with or found using any AR URL. You don't need an account for it. Uh, you don't need to be friends with somebody or follow them for it. These are just available posts publicly. And we also made sure that we only picked posts that had common hashtags associated with them. Uh, hashtags that sort of are used because people want to improve the discoverability or click-through rate or engagement with their posts. So they were looking for people to interact with them on those posts. And so we restricted all of our interactions to those kinds of posts. We also ensured that our agent introduced itself before asking any kind of question. Uh, so we, uh, before every single question, we said we were a computer science research project trying to learn about the visual world. And this message, message was sort of repeated in our agent's profile as well. And this was important because it told people who we were and what we were trying to do with, the, with our questions. And we were really trying to promote this sort of transparency. We also made sure that uh, we sent people a private message after sending them a question and after they responded um, because we wanted to make sure that they knew why or how their responses were going to be used. And we also provided them with an email address so that they could sort of come back and talk to us if they were worried about something that they had said. And then finally, uh, we also paid crowd workers to moderate the kinds of questions that we asked. So crowd workers are people that you can hire online. And they specifically were hired to make sure that none of our questions could be construed as rude or malicious. So we weren't asking people to change our questions, but we were just making sure that there's a filter in place that made sure that our automatically generated questions do not end up harming somebody or causing any sort of distress. Uh, so any of those types of questions were taken down in that filtering stage and were not posted online. So like I was saying, our agent introduced itself before asking a question, and this process led to a very interesting observation in itself. We found that the way you end up introducing your agent completely changes the way people interact with you. So for example, if we introduce ourselves as an agent, uh, as an AI, then people were primarily going to give us troll responses. 
And we wanted to study this effect in more detail. And so we launched another set of experiments where we sampled different kinds of introductions that we could use and then studied how those different kinds of introductions end up changing the way that people respond to us. Uh, and there's been a lot of work in social psych in identifying the principal axes along which we sort of um, judge each other and how those judgments affect our interactions. Um, and across a lot of these studies, the one thing that's been consistent is that social psychology says that there are two axes along which we judge one another, and those two axes are competence and warmth. So competence is how uh, capable someone is, and warmth is how nice someone is. And you can make these judgments about anybody within a few seconds of meeting them. So even for me, for example, you know immediately where I fall in, the, in competence and warmth. That's a decision you made about me the moment you started watching this uh, live stream or video. Um, and this is true for everybody in your life. You can think about any single person you know, and you know exactly where they fall in terms of competence and warmth. If they're more competent or less, or high warmth or low warmth. And so what we did was we sampled different kinds of adjectives that we could use to describe our AI systems along these two dimensions. We told people that we were building an AI system with these kinds of adjectives, and we studied how people interacted. And what we found was quite surprising. We found that people preferred agents that um, projected high warmth, but low competence, uh, which is quite unlike a lot of the ways in which AI systems are introduced today. Uh, and we built an entire theory around how to sort of operationalize or think about these kinds of uh, effects. And we also found that um, our theory is consistent with adoption patterns for which kinds of technologies have actually been used and successful in the real world and which ones have not. We can explain why things like um, Mitsuku didn't do well, whereas Replica and Wobot did much better. We can explain why people were antisocial with things like Microsoft's Tay, but people in China love Xiao Ice. We can also describe adoption patterns for things like Siri and Google Home and a bunch of other different kinds of agents that are out there in the real world. Okay, I'm going to go through a couple of quick other things as well that's quickly worth discussing. Um, one of them is this ethical calculus behind diverting a lot of people's attention towards asking our question. We're taking away time from something else that they could be doing. And we justified our interactions because people were giving us positive sentiments in response. People were showing gratitude or positive emotions. And really, I think this is kind of important to think about when you're designing AI systems out in the real world. You need to wonder if the kinds of interactions you're having are going to have a positive impact on people. We also were worried that the kinds of things that we're doing could be similarly reused by other people and used as a manipulation strategy to induce different kinds of behavioral changes. Um, we know very well that it's easy to induce emotional eff effective shifts in people based on the way you sort of interact with them. And so even though our goal was to learn new visual information, you could imagine building in other kinds of rewards that are maybe problematic at its source. And in those situations, um, the same technology that we're using to learn about the world could also be used to induce different kinds of manipulation techniques on people. And then finally, the, the kinds of interaction uh, manifolds and things that I was telling you about, a lot of these technical decisions that we're making also end up having quite a few uh, societal impacts as well. Uh, we end up limiting the kinds of questions that we can ask uh, and the kinds of data that we end up pre-training our question generation models on, it really dictates how far we can go in terms of what we can and can't learn. And so there's a lot of things that we were thinking about in terms of designing really good initial models so that we have enough sort of space to explore and find good questions to ask. We also made sure that everything we learned was um, uh, devoid of gender, uh, occupation, and age, or anything that might in any way sort of be construed as being uh, rude. The other a similar sort of related problem here is that we were sort of learning things on social media and social media tends to have a bias in terms of the kinds of content that people upload online. Uh, there's a lot of people that upload the same kinds of content everywhere. And so it gives you a very biased view of what's actually out there in the real world. So there's a need for sort of building these kinds of systems outside in the real world and not just within social uh, digital environments. Okay, so with that, let me sort of wrap up right here. Uh, I'm happy to sort of take questions and talk about um, things we've discussed here. Happy to chat about some of my future research agenda or anything else that you might have questions about. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Arjun. It was very interesting and like a uh, very new topic. Uh, actually, for me, it's a very new topic, and maybe for most of the audience who are currently watching. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we uh, actually we have a couple of questions, but uh, uh, I posted two questions. So, uh, first question actually uh, from my side. Is that like uh, how to measure the uncertainty in output space? Uh, I'm just talking about whatever the posterior mm -hmm. probability mm -hmm. values you are getting. Uh, in general sense, I'm asking actually. So, yeah. is entropy is a better way of representing this, or is there any other way to measure the uncertainty? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a bunch of different ways in which you can think about measuring uncertainty. Uh, and the nice thing is there's a wide range of research going on trying to build good uncertainty-based systems for a lot of the deep learning models that we're using today. And of course, the one you mentioned, which is using entropy as a way of measuring uncertainty in the output space, that's a pretty good one to use. That's the one we ended up using. It's uh, the first thing you should try when you're building out these kinds of things. Uh, but there's a lot more that have been created since then. There are Bayesian uh, neural networks that come with some amount of uh, stochasticity with um, how it produces outputs. And you can measure that stochasticity as um, and use its sort of standard deviation as a measure of uncertainty. You can also use techniques like dropout based uncertainty measures where you um, initialize your models with different kinds of dropout layers. And so that also induces some amount of stochasticity within your model. And because you're building these models to have some amount of redundancy in its neurons, um, dropout turns out to be a pretty good sort of approximation of um, the kind of uncertainty you get, assuming uh, that you're sampling from some Gaussian process. Um, so there's a bunch of different things other than that as well that people are building out. You can build ensemble-based models where you have different models that are each been trained on different subsets of the data, and you can use disagreements within the different models within that ensemble as also an uncertainty measurement. Uh, so there's there's a lot. Um, and uh, you know it's, it's still a very unsolved research problem. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Actually, like the problem is that uh, when we build a multi-class uh, problem, like some model, then mm -hmm. sometimes what may happen is that like we have to uh, some problem, some in, uh, some problem is there in the, in that input. So it should not detect one of the class. Rather, it should say like uh, we are not confident to give that prediction, uh, so something like that. So that right. is a very big problem actually. Sometimes in we face actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so another uh, question is that like uh, you mentioned about that latent speech, uh, space, right? Like uh, what mm -hmm. I uh, I'm assuming is that like uh, with that whatever the social interaction we're having, and we're creating some kind of latent space. So uh, mm -hmm. can we reuse that learned representation for other tasks? Is it possible to uh, do that for any other any social problems we have? Yeah, I, I would imagine you could. It really depends on uh, on the downstream task itself. Um, there's a lot of sort of representation learning based problems associated with finding the best sort of representation space for any kind of problem you're tackling. And there are different use cases that have different kinds of things that you might want to weigh. Um, and so this could be a potential solution to some, but it really depends on the end uh, task. Um, there's been uh, a lot of work in learning good representations over the over the last few years. Um, you could sort of argue that all of machine learning is sort of uh, representation learning for the most part. So you're learning good representations that you can use for something. Um, so it really depends on the end use case. Okay, okay. So actually, I'm asking about this uh, problem. Your uh, whatever the problem you solve, the social mm -hmm. the socially interactive uh, this kind of AI agents. Mm -hmm. Where multiple uh, your multi modality is there like image, text. Uh, mm -hmm. Am I correct? Like this, this is a multi model, correct? Like text will be there and image will be there. Right, right. It's a multimodal space okay. um, that that is being learned. Um, and yeah, you could sort of figure out other use cases for this that are perhaps related to the kinds of questions or things that you might ask. But again, this space is mainly representing questions. And so as long as you've got applications where you need to figure out how to ask good questions that are related to images, this space would be useful. But outside of that, maybe not. OK, fine. Thanks. Uh, and another question is that like, uh, uh, 
uh, how different than ChatGPT in simple uh, simple way, apart from multimodality. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's. Like, uh, is it like uh, we can learn directly? For example, when I uh, enter your AI agent and we just have some kind of chat, and then mm. uh, abruptly it can actually learn what ex actually I want to intend. Uh, or is it like that, or is it static kind of uh, chat GPT? How, how how is the different like in uh, simple way? Yeah, so there's quite a few interesting things between what we ended up uh, publishing and what ChatGPT ended up using. So ChatGPT ends up using a very similar technique to what we've done as well. Um, they have a pre-training stage where they, uh, here are the steps that I'm showing for ChatGPT. In step one, you end up uh, learning how to generate initial good questions. In step two, you learn a reward model. In our case, a reward model is knowledge reward and interaction reward. In their case, they're just learning a reward model for what is a good uh, versus bad uh, generation. And then finally, in the step three, they use reinforcement learning, and we use reinforcement learning with the rewards to learn how to change its behavior. So in a lot of ways, there are similar uh, sort of techniques used in both. You've got the same three steps in both, but there are quite a few differences. We have multiple rewards, uh, whereas they mainly have one big reward model. Um, we also have uh, this iterative process where our reward models are changing over time. And so we have to do this iter iteratively, whereas they have just one sort of step where they have to learn, and then that's it. So there's quite a few differences. Their their modalities are very different as well. Uh, you know, ChatGPT primarily works with just uh, well, it only works with just language, and we end up with primarily interacting with images, but um, also with questions in in natural language. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so another question from uh, for uh, maybe in a different uh, direction, uh, like. Mm -hmm. uh, um, after uh, pursuing, this is a totally different uh, question uh, than this topic actually. So uh, okay. after pursuing 10 plus 2 in Indian context, I am asking. So if anyone will pers want to pursue BS in US, uh, what actually what what will be the steps like uh, from where he or she has to start? Uh, can you give some idea on that? I see. Um, so getting into good schools is. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know if I have a good answer for you. There are a lot of uh, people out there that have really thought about this problem a lot more than I have. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the schools are looking for a wide range of things. There's no one answer that works for everybody. You know, in some schools are just looking for academic excellence. So as long as you've got academic excellence, that's all that matters. And some schools are really looking for an all rounder, somebody who does a lot of things. And so for them, it could be a whole host of things that you might want to optimize for. Uh, other people, other schools might be more interested in um, debate or sports. So it's hard to hard to know ahead of time what exactly is is the best way. I would say just go do things that you're very excited about. Find the kinds of problems or um, challenges that excite you. Do things outside of school. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the whole thing is very opaque to me as well. I don't know if I have a good answer for you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Actually, one of our audience asked that question. So yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. thanks. So yeah. So Aishman, if you want to ask any question. Yeah, uh, so uh, like it was really interesting. So like I uh, recently like a new paper came out. Uh, uh, they also like sort of used the computer vision with reinforcement learning to train uh, the models. Have you heard about it? I think like it came out only three to four days ago. Like I've been seeing the paper on Twitter quite a lot. So like it's oh yeah yeah the paper where they sort of learned how to optimize uh, rewards for bounding boxes and other kinds of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. tasks. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. Yeah. So what about what about that paper? Yeah. So like I haven't yet read the paper. So like, are there any similarities between like uh, what uh, uh, your research has done and like sort of there? So. <laughs> yeah, I, they're not exactly related. Um, there are similarities in the sense that, you know, the techniques we use in reinforcement learning are related and the domain we work in is related because it's computer vision. But their line of work, I haven't really figured out what exactly is new about that paper. People have been using reinforcement learning 
with uh, computer vision systems to optimize specific kinds of end metrics since 2016, I want to say, or even before that. I mean, back then, people were using captioning models and optimizing them with regards to CIDR uh, or Meteor as, um, as the metric, a reward metric. Um, and this paper looks very similar to that kind of work. I guess the biggest difference is that now, instead of using language and optimizing language, you're optimizing uh, structured outputs like boxes. But it feels like the same thing that people have been doing for the last six years. So I'm not really sure. Yeah, now that you say it, it, like, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like. So like I have been seeing like it's it's kind of a trend like now it is reinforcement learning is like uh, getting a lot of attention as compared mm -hmm. to like what it was a few years ago. So like uh, what's your take on that? Like, uh, like do you really think like that reinforcement learning is really helping, you know, the existing methods? Like uh, is it really helping it like? Or is the hype worth it regarding that? So I, I feel like the hype with reinforcement learning sort of started in 2017 and heightened around the time that AlphaGo came out. Um, you know, around that time, I would say, was the height of what reinforcement learning um, was. And then, you know, you started seeing a lot of robotic successes um, come out over the next few years. So there's quite a lot of achievements that have been possible because of reinforcement learning. Um, but this general problem of search uh, or finding good solutions to things, that's that's been around since the 60s. Um, you know, search problems, you know, even John McCarthy, who started the entire field of artificial intelligence in the 1960s, was really focused on finding good search algorithms for playing chess. And those same algorithms eventually sort of evolved into the kinds of reinforcement learning models we have today. So it's not really a new area per se or new hype. It's an important toolkit that we have. I don't really know what the right toolkit is uh, for solving the kinds of intelligence tasks that we have left to solve. Um, but uh, you know, for me, I think it's mostly about problem formulation more so than uh, finding the right hammers. So there are different kinds of researchers and different ways in which they view research and progress in science. And I view it in terms of problem formulation. And I don't think the solutions or the hammers are necessarily that important. If you build out the right formulations for your problems, the solutions usually become pretty obvious. And so for me, that's, that's what I think we should focus on. As long as we're tackling the right kinds of problems moving forward as a community, we'll be making good progress. But I don't know, or I don't even know if it matters what toolkit you end up using. So reinforcement learning is just one of those toolkits. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. So like, like it, it, even like, uh, it's same the case for me. So like, uh, the uh, form, formulation of the problem is like more than half of the task. Like, if you can formulate the problem properly, then like, it's pretty good. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I have any more questions right now. Okay. So, so that's all I think, uh, So thanks for your uh, informative and very uh, excellent session. So maybe yeah. again in the future, like we'll invite you for, for a different talk. Maybe yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. Yeah, thanks. So I'm going to stop the 